He investigates the neurophysiological basis of human memory using a range of tools such as fMRI, high resolution hippocampal fMRI, intracranial EEG, and scalp EEG. One main focus of his research is to study how the brain encodes spatial memory, a vital component of everyday functioning. He received his PhD from Brandeis University and was a postdoctoral doctoral researcher at UCLA before coming to Davis. Dr. Ekstrom was also named an Alfred P. Sloan Fellow in 2011, as well as a Cobley Fellow in 2012. Let us all now give a warm welcome to Dr. Arnie Ekstrom. Thanks very much for the very kind introduction. It's really exciting to be here and uh, particularly to uh, be able to follow someone talking about Watson. I watched that episode on Jeopardy and uh, was just really thrilled and excited to hear more about it and uh, to be part of the whole experience of really something that's changed history, I believe. Um, so, you know, thinking about Watson, I think there's some parallels with how our brain works and how IBM in some ways has reverse engineered what we do to try to accomplish a task that we are trying to do, which is answer questions. And this schematic gives you a little bit of a sense of how our brain has both a combination of specialized processing, uh, where we believe that certain modules within the brain, uh, such as the hippocampus, the structure we know is involved in memory, the prefrontal cortex, which does something called cognitive or executive control, uh, these are terms which are a little fuzzy, but have been broadly assigned to these areas. And we believe that these areas perform specialized function in many contexts. That'll be the first part of my talk. What are some of the specialized functions of brain areas in memory, such as the hippocampus? And then the second part of my talk will focus on how do these brain areas then interact to produce what we call cognition. Um, and the focus will really be on the idea of both combination of specialization in terms of representing spatial information, uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about representation for time later, but then how these areas may interact and how operations can occur in parallel, but then be combined through something we call spectral fingerprinting. The idea of spectral fingerprinting is essentially that different resonant frequencies between brain, brain areas, different interactions at different frequencies, can allow different cognitive interactions to emerge, different cognitive processes to emerge from the same set of brain regions. We'll get into that in a lot more detail. Um, those of you who uh, are undergraduates here at Berkeley will be very familiar with Tolman. He was one of the pioneers in the area of cognitive neuroscience because he introduced us to the idea that rats are not simple stimulus response learners, but they may form something called a cognitive map. This is very important in cognitive neuroscience because now we can talk about the idea of representation and how the brain represents information. And what we're going to be talking about today is primarily our ability to represent the spatial world around us. So decades of work since the pioneering uh, work of Tolman has defined aspects of the uh, rat's representation for its spatial environment. Why care about rats? Well, rats are a uh, species where we can do invasive recordings. We can put electrodes directly into specific parts of their brains and get quite a precise idea of how individual neurons in their brain represent things like memories, in particular, how they remember where they are. So we know quite a bit from rats about this issue. Um, there's been uh, uh, many decades of work suggesting that rats have these things called place cells. These are representations of specific locations when the rat is moving around. So for example, as I'm walking around this room, there might be a cell in my hippocampus that represents a specific spatial location and is relatively quiet at other locations. We'll talk a lot more about this as we go along. Uh, groups of neurons interact together to represent what we call optic flow. That would be the movement that the rat is experience, experiencing. And then there are other aspects of neural representations uh, also in the rat hippocampus. Um, now, one of the challenges, of course, in working with people is that we cannot do invasive recordings. Uh, we are limited primarily to non-invasive techniques. Um, however, uh, due to a, a very unique opportunity and privilege of working with neurosurgeons, my lab has been able to record directly from the human brain. We also have a center that does that here at Berkeley through uh, Bob Knight and uh, several other uh, people working in this area. Um, so uh, 
It's a unique opportunity where we have patients being monitored for clinical situations. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. These are generally high-functioning individuals, and we can look at how individual neurons and groups of neurons behave during memory tasks and try to link up what we know with rats and then extend that information based on how we learn and remember things. So that'll be the first part of my talk. And then the second part of my talk, we're going to talk about what we would call more global mapping techniques. Uh, the first part of my talk will focus on neurons that are specialized to represent information in specific brain structures. And then the second part of my talk will focus on how these brain structures may interact to uh, produce uh, something more than what an individual structure can do um, and why this might be important for the brain in solving cognitive tasks. And we're going to focus on a uh, particularly uh, interesting, what I think is an interesting area called electrocorticography. Those of you who know scalp EEG know the idea you can have an electrode grid that covers much of the signals that come out of the brain, but it's on top of the skull. Electrocorticography is unique in that grids are implanted below the skull in these patients, giving us unprecedented monitoring of neural signals that come from different areas within the cortex and, uh, and, and deeper brain structures. Um, so this will be what we're focusing on today, uh, both specialization and interactions between different brain regions. So the first part of my talk will concern uh, individual neuron responses primarily, a little bit on ensemble responses within individual brain regions. This is to give you a sense for the computational power of individual brain regions like the hippocampus and what they can do in terms of solving uh, representations uh, for spatial environments. And then we're going to try to put this together and try to understand how our ability to remember, for example, what we had for dinner last night could emerge through interactions between different brain regions. So specifically, if you think about what you had for dinner last night, you may be able to remember approximately where you are, oh, excuse me, where you were. You may also remember things about the order that events happened. Did you watch TV before you ate dinner? Uh, who, who did you talk to? Uh, various things like that include details about the spatial environment as well as the temporal order or the timing of different events. And we believe that these are key to uh, what we call episodic memory, which is your memory for events. So as I mentioned, uh, decades of work have suggested that rats have these things called place cells. Place cells are really remarkable. Uh, if you imagine looking at a uh, rat running around a maze and you look at that from a bird's eye view, you look down on the environment, uh, you will find, if you record from a single neuron, that a single neuron may represent a specific spatial location quite robustly and is relatively quiet for other locations. If you look at another neuron from the same rat hippocampus, you will find that it represents another spatial location and is relatively quiet at other areas. So the first question we wanted to ask with our recordings, uh, and these are recordings with patients who have electrodes implanted in their brain, do we have similar neural mechanisms to what is present in the rat? Do we have neurons that code specific spatial locations? And if so, why might these be important for how we navigate? Um, and uh, you can see here an example of a patient. This is an MRI. These electrodes actually come out a little bit bigger than they are due to the artifact that is uh, produced when you put uh, patients in the scanner with electrodes in. But you can see that these electrodes are contacting areas like the hippocampus and the parahippocampal gyrus. Um, these uh, recordings are done in conjunction uh, with uh, my uh, uh, former postdoc advisor, Itzhak Fried, Nitin Tandon, and uh, Kia Shali uh, at uh, UC Davis. Um, so we use a paradigm called virtual reality. This allows us to render spatial environments on a laptop computer as patients with electrodes in their brain watch this happen. Uh, so many of you may do gaming in your free time, uh, but uh, this is a little bit of a boring version compared to what you may experience in immersive uh, multiplayer online worlds. But the basic idea is that patient, uh, patients navigate these virtual environments. Uh, they look for specific uh, uh, landmarks, such as a fast, the fast food restaurant. And they navigate around until they're able to locate that particular uh, um, landmark. And what we do is we have them do this continuously for about 40 minutes or so. And this allows us to get quite a lot of immersion within these virtual environments. So they explore the environment quite extensively. They gain quite a bit of familiarity with the environment. And then we can look at how individual neurons in their brain respond to different aspects of the environment. Okay, so I'm going to present first some work from my graduate school days. Um, and this is regarding single neuron responses in the uh, human hippocampus. Imagine again, you're looking down on the virtual environment. It's a bird's eye view of the virtual environment. 
What we've done is we've divided up the entire environment into 49 different sectors. Okay? We show the landmarks here that are located in the center of the city, the three different stores, and then uh, some non-task relevant buildings uh, that are surrounding the stores. What's shown in red is the patient's trajectory as they navigate the virtual environment. And then overlaid on this, these different colors, is the actual firing rate of an individual neuron. Okay? So what you can see here is that this particular neuron fired at a high rate, about 5 hertz, in this particular spatial location, but was relatively quiet in other spatial locations. If you just compare this location over here, there was comparable amount of exploration of that location Okay, but no significant increase in firing rate. And if we plot just this area over all the trajectories, you can see that the firing rate increases in, a, increases in a manner that is similar to what's been seen in rodents. Now, of course, because it's virtual reality, we know what the person is seeing on the screen at any, any given time. So we can also analyze what they're viewing at any given time. And we found that what the patient was viewing for these particular neurons in the hippocampus did not have any effect okay, on the neural firing rate. So it was location and not what they were viewing. <coughs> now, we also found a subset of cells that did something, something interesting. When the patient had a certain goal, okay, their goal, for example, was to find store C, okay, we found that the firing rate was different than, for example, when the patient was searching for other goals. So this suggests that the map for spatial location is not, does not necessarily have the fidelity of always firing for that specific location. In other words, it remaps or it can change depending on what the patient is looking for. We believe that type of flexibility is very important to many different memory processes where you need to remember and link up different types of information. Finally, we found neurons in the parahippocampal gyrus. This is an area that receives heavy input from visual areas that responded to viewing specific landmarks. In this particular example, what we found was when the subject was viewing, the patient was viewing store A, compared to viewing the other landmarks or the passenger or the background, this cell fired at a high rate. And when we plotted the location of the patient when they were viewing store A, it fired from many different spatial locations. So this particular cell showed the property of view, not location. And we found a clustering of these neurons that was different. Place cells tended to be congregated or clustered in the hippocampus, and view-related cells tended to be congregated in the parahippocampal gyrus. Okay? So to sum up what we've talked about so far, we found that there are neurons in the human hippocampus, similar to the rodent, that respond in a place-specific fashion. These neurons also show uh, sensitivity to the temporal context, in other words, what your current goal state is at that time. And we also found that there were neurons in an area called the parahippocampal cortex that receives heavy visual input, uh, receives input from visual areas that responded to viewing landmarks. And these types of responses had never been identified previously in rodents. So since we are on a mission to try to figure out to what extent the neural machinery in our brain is conserved from what is present in the rodent and to what extent we've modified it in some form, we then decided to look at another very prominent finding from the rodent, which is something called theta oscillations. These are relatively rhythmic fluctuations of neural activity with, within the hippocampus when the rodent does very, various cognitive tasks. But they are most observable when a rat begins to move. And one of the hypotheses why this might be important, as you begin to move, you experience an increase in visual optic flow so there's more information to coordinate in order to do this. So perhaps one of the reasons why there's an increase in ensemble oscillatory activity is your hippocampus needs this in some form or another, which we don't completely understand, to coordinate with what individual neurons are doing. So, and these oscillations, when they are knocked out, impair the ability of rodents to learn sequences. So one of the things we wanted to investigate is do we have these types of oscillations, these rhythmic fluctuations, in our hippocampus when we navigate? And this work is uh, done uh, in conjunction with my graduate student, Andrew Watrous. So we approached this question two different ways. Uh, we looked uh, at recordings of two different types. You can see our patients have both what we call microwires. Those of you who do invasive recordings with rodents or uh, monkeys would be familiar with these. These are about 40 micrometer wires implanted directly in the brain structure. And uh, 
We also recorded what we call macro recordings. These are more common in humans. These are about one millimeter contacts. We found rhythmic oscillations that increased as people began to move in the virtual environment, both on these macro contacts, which pick up bigger fields, and on these microwire contacts, which are more commonly used in rats, and pick up smaller fields. So this response to changes in movement and its effect on oscillatory activity seems to hold both at the fairly micro level within the hippocampus and seems to be a property we can observe even at a larger level within the hippocampus. Now the interesting thing, and this had not been looked at much in rodents previously, was that these oscillations also seem to be modulated by what we are looking at when we navigate. Um, so we found uh, that oscillations were greatest uh, on some electrodes when the patient was looking at specific landmarks while they were navigating. So the patient is trying to find their way, they're trying to find a specific goal, they see a landmark somewhere, and we found when they were viewing that landmark an increase in oscillations. This was true whether the landmark was a goal or not a goal, but we found the greatest number of electrodes responding when the particular landmark was not a goal. So that suggested that perhaps the patient was using these non-goal landmarks to figure out where it was. Just like if I get disoriented and I see a landmark, that might be instrumental in helping me regain my bearing. That is one possible interpretation. So our data suggests that there are oscillations in the human hippocampus during movement, similar to what has been seen previously in the rodent, but that these oscillations show an additional modulation by what we are looking at and therefore may be playing a role in updating our current spatial position based on what we see at any given time. So, you know, it's funny, if you look from the outside, you wonder, why do academics get so bogged down in these little debates like how many angels fit into a pinhead? And when you get immersed in this area, you realize sometimes that these little debates often can have really big consequences in terms of understanding things. Um, so issues that we've been debating for decades in the field sometimes result in uh, dramatic changes in the methodologies and the ways that we have of approaching questions. Sometimes they don't result in anything, to be totally honest with you. Uh, but they are often very useful because they answer questions that are fundamental to the field. In this particular case, one question that came up with our research was, do we even have oscillations at all in our hippocampus that are relevant in any way to memory? It seems surprising that we would be debating a question about this, but there was a, a prominent study that suggested that monkeys don't have the types of oscillations that are typically seen in rats. Um, and other studies suggested that they might. Now, we'd seen these oscillations quite prominently in people, so we wanted to try to figure out why might there be this discrepancy between what's in, what rats and humans do. And I want to emphasize this as an important issue Let's say that the rat brain does something fundamentally different than the human brain. That seems like kind of a crazy idea, and that's almost certainly incorrect. But let's say that that's the case. All the models that we develop in neuroscience with rats, we would have to be very careful in how we port those to humans. But if it's the case that many of the basic neural mechanisms present in rodents are also conserved and present in humans in some form or another, then that suggests that inferences we make about rat and uh, about rodent memory as far as the neural basis may also apply in some ways to humans. And our research has generally suggested that many of these basic neural mechanisms like place cells and oscillations related to movement are present in our brain as well. But there was some argument that maybe just humans and rats and primates and rats are different. So my graduate student and I uh, conducted a study where we were able to get a, a hold of uh, rodent um, recordings and compare these with our human recordings. So these are rats that were navigating. We compared them with people navigating a virtual environment. And we used a new method, and I think it's worth mentioning that new methods are really what provide some of the big, biggest breakthroughs in neuroscience as long as we can get a hold and make sense of what these methods are meaning. Um, traditionally in the field, we'd often look just at what the raw traces, what the signal looked like, and used methods that really didn't get us much farther than that. And one of the things that we wanted to do was take methods that were in the field that had been developed mathematically and look at these oscillations in a little more sophisticated fashion. So to do this, we used a methodology called BOSC. Uh, nerds always call things uh, with funny acronyms. It stands for Better Oscillatory Detection Method kind of gets at the point, where you define an oscillation based on how many cycles it went for and that it exceeds a certain duration. 
Okay? And we compared rats running in a comparable situation to our virtual environment uh, by, by using um, an experimental setup that was generally similar. And we found, not to our surprise, but maybe to the surprise of some, that both rats and humans, in fact, have rhythmic oscillatory activity when they navigate in their hippocampus. Uh, what you can see in red is humans, and what you can see in blue is rats. I think you can see fairly clearly, just looking at these raw traces, that the rat brain seems to have a little more rhythmicity than our brain in this particular context. And our methodology that we used allowed us to look at this in more detail, showing that, in fact, we had fewer cycles of oscillations when we were navigating. And overall, the oscillation was of a lower frequency than what was observed in rats. So compared to rodents, uh, our hippocampus uh, seems to display oscillations that are less continuous and peak at a lower frequency band uh, during navigation. But it's worth emphasizing that these types of interspecies comparisons, although extremely valuable, are very difficult to do because it's almost impossible to control all the things that a rat does and make it comparable with what we do. Um, so to conclude the first part of my talk, where we focused primarily on the uh, uh, computational capacity and uh, the basic neural mechanisms present in individual brain structures, uh, um, what we can conclude so far from what I've shown you, or what I'd like to be able to conclude so far from what we've shown you, uh, human and rodent hippocampal neurons code spatial location and can change their representation depending on the goal location. Um, we also found neurons in an area called the parahippocampal gyrus, which responded to viewing landmarks. Uh, oscillations, or the um, concerted activity of groups of neurons within the hippocampus, uh, similar to rodent, are, uh, similar to the rat, are also modulated by things like running speed. But these oscillations also respond to viewing landmarks and potentially play a role in updating our position. Um, and uh, human hippocampal low-frequency oscillations, at least in the experimental setups that we've looked at so far, seem to have different characteristics to what's been present in rodents. Rodent oscillations appear to be more continuous and uh, peak at a higher frequency than what is present in our hippocampus. Um, so all of this together suggests uh, the possibility that these oscillations are important for coordinating what goes on in an individual brain structure. Okay? And what we're going to talk about in the next section of the talk is how different brain regions can communicate. So that this specialization that an individual brain region might be uh, developing on a millisecond scale can be shared between different brain structures. Okay? And that gets into an idea of uh, multiplexing and spectral fingerprinting that we'll talk uh, particularly at the end of the talk uh, quite a bit on as long as I don't run out of time. How much more time do I have? Cool. Okay. So what we're going to do right now is try to interface from the level of individual brain regions Okay, to try to look at how brain regions interact using methodologies that are better suited for that, like functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, and then uh, electrocorticography, which give you a little bit of a better picture of how brain regions interact on a larger scale. So one of the conundrums that we ran into when doing with this research was that fMRI and single neuron recordings are really very different methodologies for approaching the brain. Um, those of you who know cognitive neuroscience and, and work in that area, if you're a graduate student, for example, you might find that the approach that someone takes who studies a rat is very different than someone who puts a person in a scanner. And there, were, uh, there was quite a bit of work to suggest that, in fact, the human hippocampus was not necessarily the big player in spatial navigation. It was an area called the parahippocampal gyrus, which I've already mentioned. We found neurons that responded to specific views of landmarks. This had also been suggested with fMRI, but fMRI cannot resolve the, at the level of single neurons. Um, and we wanted to try to understand then, what is the role of the hippocampus? We know from decades of work that the hippocampus is important for memory. Lesions to the hippocampus cause enterograde and retrograde amnesia. They <coughs> profoundly impair the ability to learn new events and recall recently learned events. So we know it plays a role in memory, and we can be very confident of that, that it plays a role in memory. Uh, but the question is, what exactly is it doing, and how is it accomplishing this? So what we wanted to try to understand is, using fMRI, what might be the role of the hippocampus? And since there had been so much work in the rat to suggest its importance for remembering spatial locations, we wanted to see maybe there is more to it than just space. Maybe integrating spatial information across time, as our data with our single neuron uh, recording suggested, 
may be an important factor. So we asked the question, could spatiotemporal components be a factor in how our hippocampus codes information as we navigate? Okay? And this work was done in conjunction with my postdoc, Hui Zhang. So we had a paradigm, which is a little bit complicated, and I'll try to break it down to its essentials. If you want more details on it, I can go into that uh, offline. We had people study what would be tantamount to a bunch of different maps broken up into little pieces. So people uh, uh, would study a map with a central landmark. This was present every time uh, they viewed snapshots of the city. And then they saw a target that they had to learn that was located somewhere on the periphery, as well as this blue store, which was randomly placed every trial. Okay? So what they had to learn to do was they had to learn to associate the position of this store with this central landmark. Okay? And they had to remember that there's this blue thing that's going to occur in random locations every trial. Okay? And this is not the most fun experiment to be in because it's quite difficult to do, but we found that uh, subjects were able to learn to remember the locations of targets on the periphery using the landmark. This is what we call an allocentric spatial strategy where you reference to external landmarks in order to find your way. Um, we had uh, another condition called the spatiotemporal integration condition. This was the one where if you're a subject in the experiment, you say, darn, I didn't think they were going to do this. Now I have to think outside the box a little bit. And in this particular manipulation, there was no centrally placed landmark. Subjects, while they were in the scanner, had to use their memory of where one store was to reference to one of the other stores. Keep in mind, they'd never seen these together on any learning trial. So they had to extrapolate or use information, what Neil Cohen calls flexibly, to solve this particular task. Okay? And then in the randomly located uh, task, they couldn't use any map of any kind because the store had appeared randomly at, during every encoding trial. So we hypothesized that the spatiotemporal integration condition integrating across different trials in time okay, to put together flexibly the different spatial locations might induce the most hippocampal involvement compared to just remembering the relationship allocentrically between two different stores. And uh, behavior, importantly, was comparable between the rigid and the flexible task. In the rigid task, we found a host of brain areas that have been uh, reported uh, in other spatial navigation studies. When people just remembered the location of a store relative to the central landmark, we found areas of the brain like retrosplenial uh, cortex uh, and precuneus uh, that were active. Um, this suggested that these areas might be involved in what we call allocentric memory, your ability to reference information to your external world. Um, but we did not find the hippocampus in any of those contrasts. Um, however, we did find that hippocampal activation tended to decrease okay, over learning trials in the flexible condition or the spatiotemporal integration condition. So keep in mind, people are navigating this environment continuously. They're experiencing it again and again. So they're eventually starting to learn this stuff and put the structure together. So hippocampal activation may be strongest when the spatiotemporal integration demands in the beginning may be strongest. And in addition, we found that there was significant connectivity between the hippocampus and some of these cortical areas that we believe are more centrally involved in remembering two different objects relative to each other in space. So these data suggest that um, many of the areas that are often associated with referencing to external stimuli, um, uh, we, we replicated those basic findings that these are important. But our data suggests that the hippocampus was not one of the big players in that relatively simple process, but the hippocampus was instead involved when there was uh, the need for integrating between spatiotemporal variables. So one of the issues that we ran into when considering the issue of space and time, and those of you who are cognitive scientists may particularly agonize over this. As a neuroscientist, I can conveniently sleep well at night because linguistic definitions often don't bother me as much as I know they do in other fields. But um, in this particular case, we did get a little bit bothered because we know that in, uh, there are many debates within the literature of the degree that space and time can be interchangeable as forms of representation. Linguistically, we often use spatial metaphors when we talk about time, for example, uh, something that was more distant in our past. Um, so the two metrics are often so intertwined that it's very difficult to be able to say, are we using one or the other? Um, so just as an example, uh, in, a very, in a prominent review paper within the neuroscience literature, people have hypothesized that 
really, when you're learning a spatial environment, you're just, you're, although you're learning place, you're learning the order of events. So pretty much you get space and time at the same time. And these two things are really the same thing. Um, now, we were up against a literature that also suggested how important some of these different brain regions were for remembering context that involve space and time. So we wanted to try to get a sense then, what exactly does the hippocampus do when we don't have to necessarily remember space and time as the same thing, but when we have to independently encode these two representations? And this was work done in conjunction with my research assistant, now turned graduate student, Milagros Kopara. So we designed a task, and I want to emphasize this task is a little unnatural, but ends up uh, resulting in what we wanted, which was to dissociate our representation for spatial layout and temporal context or temporal order. So what we have people do is they look for a passenger in the center of the city, and they have to take the passenger to one of these stores, it's just like in the other paradigms I've talked about. But we constrain the order in which they go to these stores so the order in which they explore the stores is different, unrelated, to the actual spatial layout. Okay? I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But basically, they have to learn that they visited the stores in a certain order like this. Okay? And they have the spatial layout then that occurs as a uh, two-dimensional array that they have to learn separately. Okay? And then we have them retrieve this information. Again, this is not a fun sub uh, uh, paradigm uh, experiment to be in as a subject, I hear. Um, you see a reference store here, and then you see two other stores below it. You have to say which of these two stores was closer to the reference store, either in the spatial layout or within the temporal order. And again, this is a hard task for us to do. We have to use two competing representations at the same time okay, and figure out which one we have to use, and then answer the question correctly based on correctly accessing the information within the one representation. Just as a side note, we have a whole series of behavioral studies where we show that, in fact, we can dissociate our representation of a spatial layout from temporal order. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details on this, but the basic idea is when the layouts are, when the temporal order is uncorrelated from the spatial layout, there is no facilitation when you remember temporal context in terms of remembering spatial context and vice versa. However, if we make these two things correlated, in other words, the order tells you the layout, then we do in fact find a facilitation. So that suggests that we can set up the experiment so that people in fact do have to remember these as separate representations. One of the great things about working with people, which is much harder to do of course with monkeys and rats, is we can just ask them, did you use two different representations or not? Not everyone knows, so it's not a perfect way. But in general, our results suggested that people, in fact, from the surveys, use different representations for space and time. Now, we then did a neuroimaging study where we had people do these spatial and temporal retrieval questions in the scanner. Um, we found that just generally remembering spatial or temporal information recruited the hippocampus. So the hippocampus was involved any time you had to use either spatial or temporal context. Okay? But um, most interestingly, from, from our view, we found that there were also areas of the brain that seemed to respond uniquely to remembering spatial context or temporal context. And we found that there was an area of prefrontal cortex that showed greater activation during the temporal than the spatial task. And we found there was an area within the parahippocampal cortex. We talked already about the parahippocampal cortex and its importance in uh, representing view-based landmark information that responded to a greater extent during the spatial than the temporal task. Now, really what we're trying to say here is what brain areas might be more involved in one task than another, not that one is uniquely involved, because what we ultimately want to look at and which we're working toward is how these different brain regions interact. But I think the most important part of what's, what I would like you guys to get out of this is that the hippocampus here is acting as an interface or acting as a convergence zone for spatial and temporal information and that is involved in both situations. So consistent, uh, our data are consistent with a general role for the hippocampus in retrieval of contextual information, particularly spatial and temporal contextual information. Um, and it suggests that aspects of spatial and temporal representation, uh, the uh, individual parts, may be processed outside the hippocampus. So then the challenge is, how do we get this information into the hippocampus? How do we get information from other cortical brain areas eventually to interact with the hippocampus? So the, the question that we're working toward is, we have specialization within the brain. How do these specialized modules interact in a way where you can have uh, a, a, a basically a greater sum than what the individual parts can do?
This is, again, work that I'm going to be presenting for my graduate student, Andrew Watchers. So the question that we ask in, this, in the spatial temporal task that we've developed, what types of interactions are present between brain regions when you correctly recall spatiotemporal context? These, uh, this study that I'm going to talk about is using electrocorticography uh, um, um, recordings from patients. Uh, it was recently published in Nature Neuroscience, uh, so feel free to look it up and read more about it if, uh, if you're interested. So these electrocorticography experiments, I want to emphasize again, are quite unique. Um, we have quite extensive coverage of different parts of the brain simultaneously. So what we've done here is on a template brain, we've plotted the uh, different uh, electrodes that we had across our patients. You can see that we're getting quite good coverage of areas of the frontal lobe, areas of the perihippocampal gyrus, okay, and as well areas of parietal cortex, um, which are a little bit harder to see on here, but we are also getting uh, some parietal cortex coverage as well. Importantly, we found that there was no difference in accuracy for performing the spatial and temporal task. So what we did is we looked at how recordings in these different sites were recording simultaneously from parts of the frontal lobe, parts of prefrontal cortex, from parietal cortex and medial temporal lobe, we're recording from these simultaneously. How did these different signals interact during recall of context? Okay. So what we found was that there were many electrodes where we saw oscillations that tended to coincide in time. Okay, so here's an example of an electrode that we recorded from the uh, perihippocampal gyrus, or the medial temporal lobe, um, and the inferior parietal lobule. Okay? And you can see the red signal is the perihippocampal gyrus. The blue signal is in the inferior parietal lobule. You can see the, see the two signals tended to show what we call phase synchronization. Okay? The two oscillations tended to overlap significantly in time so that they tended to do similar things at similar times. We used a method called um, a time, uh, time frequency analysis to identify on an individual electrode that there was greater coherence okay, across electrodes for retrieving context correctly compared to retrieving context incorrectly. And this was true across our group of six patients on this particular pair of electrodes. But what we really wanted to know was not just what an individual pair of electrodes did anywhere in the brain, but what all the electrodes that we were recording from simultaneously did in our patients. So we adopted a graph theoretic approach. This was a relatively new mathematical technique that we uh, were introduced to, um, to try to map out how these interactions might be occurring across multiple brain regions. Each of these little acronyms is a different brain area. This is superior frontal gyrus, medial frontal gyrus, inferior frontal gyrus, all parts of prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobe. This is the superior parietal lobule, the precuneus, and in the, the inferior parietal lobule, and this is the perihippocampal gyrus. Okay? What we found was that connectivity across these multiple recording sites, okay, these multiple brain areas, was higher during correct contextual retrieval compared to incorrect contextual retrieval. So this suggests a basic facet of when you recall information is not just that one brain region gets it, not one brain region in isolation is active, but that in general the interactions between multiple brain areas is higher. Okay? And we then broke down the connections okay, as a function of each of these individual nodes to try to figure out where was the connectivity the greatest. And we found that the connectivity was consistently greatest to the medial temporal lobe or the perihippocampal gyrus during correct retrieval. So this is kind of like thinking about airports, that there are usually hubs when you fly around the countries, a country, and then areas that are not as connected. We then think of the medial temporal lobe as a hub in this particular situation, in that both spatial and temporal information is converging on the medial temporal lobe from these different cortical sites. Um, this is another way of looking at it. Those of you who love linear algebra and matrix algebra may find this more appealing. But the, the quick take-home message from here is when we looked across the low frequency band from 1 to 10 hertz, we found the greatest amount of connectivity for correct versus incorrect retrieval. And this was true across a range of different frequencies from 1 to 10 hertz. Okay? That means 1 cycle versus 10 cycles per second. So these data suggest that network connectivity increases globally when we correctly recall spatiotemporal context, and that the perihippocampal gyrus acts as a hub or a convergence zone for this information during memory.
Now, one of the things that I think is always important to do in neuroscience is always be a little cautious with inferences at the group level. People will tell you something along the lines of the more statistics you do, the further lost you get in terms of figuring out what your data mean. And what we wanted to look at was for an individual patient, okay, let's say we had you in a situation where we could record from multiple sites in your brain, would it be the case that you as an individual showed greater connectivity across multiple brain areas? These network maps are a little crazy to be able to look at, but each of these dots represents an individual electrode implanted at multiple areas within the patient's brain. This is correct retrieval and this is incorrect retrieval. What I think you can see in these two examples of patients, all the patients show this trend, is that connectivity across the entire brain is higher during correct versus incorrect retrieval. Okay? This patient had less degree of coverage, but the same principle holds here. There was greater connectivity during correct retrieval compared to incorrect retrieval. Okay? Anytime you get an interesting finding, you always want to, of course, replicate it and see how robust it is. We used a different methodology called functional magnetic resonance imaging in conjunction with functional connectivity to look at this in our normal subjects. I already showed you some fMRI data from undergraduates performing this task. We took these same data, a rotation student did, and then we looked at how the hemodynamic response function may be shared or different across different brain regions. This is a coarser methodology, but we got essentially the same results in that we saw greater connectivity across a range of different cortical areas, particularly medial temporal lobe areas, during correct retrieval compared to incorrect retrieval. Okay, so this suggests, again, that this increase in connectivity during correct contextual retrieval is a general characteristic of uh, of multiple areas within our brain. Now, the last thing we wanted to look at within our task was the issue of frequency specificity. Okay? So, spatial and temporal retrieval is interesting, but how are we able to differentiate spatial layouts from information about time? In other words, <laughs> given that we have two competing representations, how can we differentiate spatial context from temporal context? Okay? So, what we did is we compared trials where people correctly retrieved temporal context, this is in our patients, with spatial context. What we found was that when patients correctly retrieved information from the spatial layout, there was lower frequency coherence than when they correctly retrieved the temporal order information, which tended to happen at a faster frequency. Looking at the group level, we found that this was true. You can see temporal order retrieval in dark colors, spatial layout retrieval in lighter colors. The temporal order retrieval is characterized by faster resonant frequencies than spatial layout retrieval. We use the same graph theoretical approach to plot these graphs for different frequencies. Okay? And what we found was that for spatial layout, there was greater connectivity from 1 to 4 hertz, the lower frequency within the, the 1 to 10 hertz frequency band, compared to spatial layout retrieval at the higher frequency band. And temporal order retrieval showed the opposite pattern. Okay? The resonant interactions occurred at a higher frequency than uh, for, um, uh, compared to spatial layout retrieval. Okay? Another way of plotting it is just to break down the individual uh, um, connections and add them up uh, all together. So you can see spatial layout retrieval, the connectivity was greater at the lower frequencies compared to temporal order retrieval, which was greater at the higher frequencies. And we also found that this was true on the individual patient level as well. So to try to wrap up, what I've shown you from the last study is how multiple brain regions can interact and how information can be shared in parallel between different brain structures. Um, and the data suggest that one of these facets is, in general, when you correctly recall information, greater interactions between multiple brain regions. Okay? And in particular, that retrieving different facets of a memory may involve interactions at different frequencies. Okay? Why might this be important? Well, Bob Knight, who's here at Berkeley, has a very interesting proposal on this topic. We have the problem, believe it or not, of a relatively limited number of brain regions that could be involved in any cognitive task. Okay? But we need to use these specific brain regions all the time during any given cognitive task. So how is it the case that the same brain regions can solve different computational tasks? In the context of memory, how can the same brain regions okay, retrieve different types of contextual information? And Bob's proposal uh, and, and, and uh, others, uh, Siegel and Holland, suggests that the frequency at which brain regions interact may be instrumental in recruiting specific ensembles differentially that may be important for different cognitive tasks. Okay? It's a little bit of a punt in a sense to say we've got to look at an even more micro level but then still look at the global level. There's still a lot of things we don't know. But it's a really novel way of thinking about the brain 
not in terms of brain mapping of what individual, what individual structure might do, but how they might interact at certain frequencies to produce unique aspects of cognition. So in the second part of my talk, we talked about the idea that the hippocampus may be a brain structure, not just involved in spatial memory, but spatiotemporal integration. And then we talked about the role of some of extra cortical areas in this process. But then we moved toward the idea of what we call spectral fingerprinting, that the frequency of interactions between different brain regions may be important for allowing different types of computations, like retrieving different memories. So in conclusion, and I apologize for going over, um, is that uh, human hippocampus uh, contains comparable neural machinery for spatial representation as those described in rodents. There appears to be some con conservation of the basic mechanisms for representing space, okay? uh, but then with some potential differences, and these would relate to responses to viewing specific landmarks. Um, our data also suggest that at least our hippocampus may be more sensitive to spatiotemporal components rather than spatial components alone. Um, and finally, that spatiotemporal interactions may be important for, uh, I'm sorry, spectrotemporal interactions. In other words, the frequency at which brain regions interact may be important for differentiating spatial versus contextual details. I just want to thank all the people that made this research possible. My postdoc, Hui Zhang, my uh, graduate student, Andrew Watrous, and my uh, graduate student, Milagros Kopara, my wonderful collaborators at UC Davis and elsewhere, Nitin Tandon, Kia Shale, Sean Ranganath and Andy Onalinas, and my phenomenal mentors and uh, funding institutes who uh, made this all possible. Thank you very much.